The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Everybody, every family has problems, and it doesn't matter how much money you make. Your problem may be home ownership or education for your children or provision for accidents or sickness. Whatever it is, worrying won't help. But you can consult a neighbor of yours who may help you best of all. He is your local Equitable Society representative. He's friendly, helpful, and he knows the answers. In about 13 minutes, I want to tell you more about your Equitable Society representative and how he may help you, too, enjoy peace of mind through membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Escape. It's titled, The Three-A-Day Fugitive. In the 1951 fiscal year report made by Director G. Edgar Hoover... There was a summary reflecting the investigative accomplishments of your FBI during the year. One of the results showed that in a single year, your FBI had apprehended more than 6,000 fugitives, an average of well over 100 a week. Some of those fugitives were bad check artists. Some were auto thieves. And some, like the one in this evening's case, were killers. Tonight's FBI file opens in a western state. It is early evening. A mud-splattered sedan, driven by a bushy-haired man in a loud sports jacket, rumbles along a desolate stretch of highway. With him are two women. Isn't this part of the country beautiful? Yeah. Academy Award scenery. I can't eat scenery. You still hungry? What do you think I've been doing back here, eating on notices? I'll ad-lib a sandwich for you. Well, that'll be your first ad-lib since we hit the road. And far across the hills they went, in that new world which is the old. Hmm? Tennyson wrote that. Who? Alfred Lord Tennyson. At the Institute, we had to memorize his poetry and recite it out loud. That's how we learned cadence, huh? How to get a ripple in our voice when we read a line. Oh, too bad you got a ripple with this broken down material. Oh, I enjoy working with you and Woody. As Professor Wilkins told me, this will give me a background in case I'm ever called upon to play a vaudeville actress in a drama. Oh. Hey, uh, Lady Dracula, what's wrong with the material? Well, the last time it got a laugh, it was used by a traveling troupe at Valley Forge. The sailor bit is brand new. But I buy it, and what happens? The stagehands know it better. I felt I had the proper perspective. Let's run through it and throw it in the first show tomorrow. Without warning anybody? I'm on my hands and knees in the sailor suit. Now, Gloria, you come on stage left. Come on. Come on. Oh. Sailor, what are you doing? The Admiral told me to swab the deck. But you're in Philadelphia. Ruth, you've got the next line. I know, I know. I didn't forget it at the last show. I just didn't have the nerve to say it. If we do it right, we'll get a laugh. Okay, so I walk up to you and I say, Sailor, what are you looking for? My wallet. I'll be court-martialed unless I find it. Where did you misplace it? Across the street. Well, why don't you look over there? There's more light here. Then you both get down on your knees with me while they're laughing. We can't bend that fast. Oh, no. What's that? Well, it's either the tire or a critic. Oh, what a great little spot for a flat. Do we have a spare? Yeah, but no jack. Ad lib one. Dandy. Hey, those lights up ahead. That must be Crystal City. Where are you going? To find a gas station. Clever? Woody, 
You don't have to walk all the way down there. Look at those big rocks. What about them? At the Institute, they taught us to improvise when the property man couldn't secure the correct articles. Honey, get with it. Well, if we roll the car up onto a rock, it would lift the wheel enough to allow us to change the tire. <laughs> Sorry, girl, that's not my line of work. You two wait here. I'll be right back with a jack, then we drive into town and hit the sack. That was written by Tennyson, too. <laughs> Sam Tennyson. Can I help you, sir? I hope so, pal. My car's got a flat. Where? Down the road, and I got no jack. Can you mosey over and fix it? Sorry, I can't leave the station. Well, will you lend me a jack without a cosigner? Yes, if you'll be sure to... Sure to what? Uh, bring it back. Oh, I'll drop it when I come past. You... You have to sign a receipt. Okay. Gee, must be half past lonesome working here. Get him up. What? Don't move or I'll shoot. Pal, if you don't want to lend me the jack, say so. I almost didn't recognize you. Just stand there while I call the sheriff. Meanwhile, at the FBI field office in a nearby large city, Special Agent Taylor approaches the desk of Agent in Charge Malden. Taylor, were you in on the Frank Dudley arrest? Uh, Dudley? Two years ago, he's the hold-up man who used that woman as a shield and killed her when he got outside the bank. Oh, yeah. Bank robbery charges are still pending against him. Yes, I know, Mr. Malden. I arrested him. I'll have to try and do it again. But he was given a life sentence. I know. He was being brought in from the state prison to testify at a trial here. Oh. When the train was about ten miles outside of Crystal City, he slugged the guard and escaped. Well, when did this happen? Tonight. Dudley got the guard's gun and an extra clip of ammunition, so don't take any chances. All right, sir. I think you know Sheriff Gardner at Crystal City. Yeah. Lee and I have worked together quite a bit. He had the local radio station broadcast an alarm and his men are covering the area. But if Dudley gets up into those hills back of Crystal City, he'll be hard to flesh out. Uh -huh. Oh, has anyone been in touch with the prison? I've got a call in for them now. You might as well get started, though. All right, sir. If I get anything from the warden, I'll put it on the teletype. Anything else I can do? <clears throat> no, kid. I just got to tighten these lugs. Oh, then you're finished? Uh -huh. Except for putting on the hubcap. You know, I knew we'd have this job done before Big Chief lay an egg got back. <clears throat> oh, he's coming. Where? Down the road. See him? Oh, for once his timing is perfect. He's back just in time to miss doing any work. Come on, let's get back in the car and ignore him. You know, it'd serve him right if we just drove off and left him stay. Hold it. Huh? What is this? Come on, get in the car. We'll take a little ride. But we've got to wait here. This gun says you don't. Come on, get moving. Say, pal, what's with that sheriff? He's coming now. There's his car. Well, now we'll get this thing straightened out. Hey, by the way, pal, about that jack. I still got to get that flat fixed. We can talk about that later. Hello, Adams. Hi, Sheriff. Sheriff, tell him I'm not the guy you're looking for. He's the one, isn't he, Sheriff? No, I'm not sure. What is this, a rib? Well, he looks like that description you gave on the radio. Well, yes and no. I'm a comedian, not a crook. I can prove it. You came here down the side road... That's right. Well, it's my car you passed. The one with the two girls in it. They're part of my act. We were on our way to Crystal City. Now drive me back to the car and the girls will give you a rundown on me. There's no car parked on that road. Oh, now I know it's a rip. An FBI man is on his way here now. FBI? I'll have to hold you till he arrives. <laughs> Mister, where are we taking you? You'll find out. Ruth, look. There's a policeman up there. Mm. I 
It's a roadblock. Now listen, and listen carefully. Just stay right in line. I'm gonna lay down on the floor under these suitcases. When you get to the cop, just give them the right answers. Why should we protect you? Because I got this gun. That policeman must have one, too. Before he took me, I could get one of you. Maybe the both of you. Okay, you. What? Just uh, lean back and pile them suitcases on me. Yes, sir. Uh, right. There. Yeah, yeah, that's good enough. The policeman's waving us up. Good evening. You see a man walking along the highway? No, sir. Where are you coming from? Auburn. We're showgirls. We're opening tomorrow night in Crystal City. Oh? Okay. Go ahead. Now, make that right turn and head up into the hills. Sheriff. Hello, Taylor. May I have your man for you? Oh, good. Where is he? The next room. Okay. I don't know for sure whether it's Dudley or not. He answers the general description, but he claims he's uh, some kind of actor. Huh? Oh, thanks, sir. Hey, Sheriff, how long are you going to keep me here? Is this the man? Yep. For Sheriff, he's not Frank Dudley. Well, hallelujah. Give me five, pal. I'm Woody Webster, the man that makes you laugh. Oh, oh yeah. On the chance he wasn't Frank Dudley, I kept the roadblocks up. Good. Now, Sheriff, what about my car? Those dames will think I walked out on them. Be with you in a minute, Webster. Oh, I All brought right. some pictures of Dudley for you, Sheriff. We ought to post these as soon as possible. All right. Sheriff. In here, Tom. I left Clark in charge at the block. Deputy Ford, this is Agent Taylor. Hello, Ford. How do you do, sir? Sheriff, I got to get back to those dames. Well, sir, I told you that there was no car parked on the back road. But I left it there. Well, that back road's near the railroad tracks, isn't it? Not too far. Webster, when'd you leave your car? Ooh, about 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Well, that'd be a little while after Dudley jumped off the train. You know, it's entirely possible he came along after you started for the city and commandeered your car. But those two girls in the car are my partners. We're supposed to open tomorrow. Uh, say, were those girls in a gray sedan... That's the crate. Well, they went through the roadblock 15 minutes ago, headed the other way. Mister, how much further are we going? Just past those big trees. There's a cabin. Just stop right in front. What for? I'm meeting someone there. I hope we have enough gas to get back. Ah, no car here. Hmm. No lights on the inside either. Maybe his car's around on the other side. Yes, sir, pull up a little. Enough? Yeah, I'll do. Hmm. I guess he didn't make it. Shut off the motor. Why? Shut it off. Let's have them keys. Here. Now, come on, get out. Where are we going? We're going into the cabin and wait for my pal. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. If your problem is protection for yourself and your family, no matter what, then I'm sure you'll be interested in the experience of Mr. Willard Trigby, one of the five million members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Will you tell us, Mr. Trigby, what influenced you to join the Equitable? Well, my wife and I were worried about how we could send our boy to college. And then one night we heard you describe an easy way to plan ahead for our son's education. That's the Equitable Education Fund. That's right. Our local equitable representative explained how the education fund made it easy to provide for our boy's education while he was growing up. That's spreading the cost of his education over 10 or 15 years instead of four. Not only that, 
But if something happens to you, the fund becomes fully established and no more payments are necessary. Ah, that's what I like about it. And another thing, Mr. Keating, our equitable representative is a man I like to do business with. He's genuinely friendly and very helpful, and he's certainly solved our problem. That's an excellent description of an equitable representative. You see, equitable men are specialists. Providing protection is their business, and they know it from A to Z. They are not only specially trained, but they are backed up by a staff of experts in the equitable home office. Actuaries, technicians, and economists. So, please bear this in mind. No matter what your insurance problem, it will pay you to get acquainted with your local equitable man. He'll discuss your problem without any obligation. Simply consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local equitable representative. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to tonight's FBI file, The Three-A-Day Fugitive. The wanton attack on the prison guard by the killer in tonight's case and the subsequent taking of the female hostages were typical of the seriousness of crimes committed in this country in the last year. According to the latest FBI uniform crime report, more than 12,000 people met death at the hands of killers during 1951 and almost 150,000 people were feloniously assaulted, including all categories, Crime increased more than 5% over the previous year, which means your crime bill is up that much. For do not make the mistake of many people who feel impervious to the criminals in our midst. The girls in tonight's case felt that way too, until too late. Without warning, crime can strike anyone, including you. Tonight's FBI file continues a few minutes later at the office of Sheriff Gardner. Sheriff, have you come up with my partners? Not yet, Mr. Webster, but we sent out an alarm on your car. You can wait around if you like and see if we get any word. Thanks. Hi, Sheriff. Hi. Heard from the prison yet? Yeah. Dudley told one of his cellmates he was going to meet a pal at a cabin. Where? In the hills up behind here. That's all the location he mentioned. Mm, lots of cabins up there. How many roads run off the main highway, Sheriff? Quite a few. Uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this green line's Route 33. Oh. Now, here's the intersection Webster's car went through. Well, then if Dudley was with the girls, they might have gone up Oak Hill Road, Skyline Drive, or any one of these others. We just don't have enough men to cover all of them. Sheriff, I never did this kind of bit, but if I can help... Excuse me, Webster. Sheriff Gardner. A woman just called in about Webster's car. From where? Oak Hill Road. She saw it going up about ten minutes ago. Thanks, Tom. We'll get right on it. Let us out. Let us out. Take it easy. Take it easy, kid. But he can't leave us locked in here. That ain't in our contract. Oh, how can you just stand here and not do anything? Honey... At my age, you just save your strength for a spot where it might do some good. Maybe if I yelled that one of us was sick, he'd open the door and we could hit him over the head. <laughs> that bit went out with mustache cups. The best thing that we can do is to just be quiet and not get him annoyed. What's that? Maybe it's his friend. George, where you been? I got stopped at a roadblock. Let's get on the Erie. Where'd you get the outfit? Out of one of the suitcases in the car I came in. I made a couple of dames bring me here. Dames? What were they doing with that? Oh, how do I know? He must have on one of Woody's costumes. Uh-huh. We better stay here till they pull down those roadblocks. We can't. Why not? The cops will be looking for those dames. I'm going east. How? Oh, by plane. Let's call the airport and find out when the next one is. I can't hear them anymore. Well, maybe they'll come back after they call the airport. Hold it, Sheriff. There's a car. 
Looks like Webster's. Uh -huh. Come on, let's move in. in this room. Oh, thank you. Are you both all right? Yeah, who are you? I'm county sheriff. Where's Dudley? Who? Uh, look at this picture. Is this the man who locked you in there? That's him. Do you know where he went? Well, somebody came here in a car after he heaved us in there. How long ago? Well, maybe half an hour. Can you tell us anything about his friend? No, we never saw him. Well, the guy who brought us here was talking about some outfit he was wearing. Uh -huh. And he said something about an airport. Sheriff, is there an airport in Crystal City? No, but there's one at Lexington. That's 15 miles from here. 15 miles, huh? Well, they left about a half an hour ago. Well, maybe they haven't gotten there yet. Let's alert them. <laughs> This is car three. Can you hear me? Come in, car three. Hello, Ford. Is Mr. Webster there? Yeah, just a minute. Oh, Webster. Hello? This is Agent Taylor, Mr. Webster. We found your partners. Are they okay? Yes, but your suitcase was broken into, and from what the girls heard, the escape man stole an outfit of yours. Which one? They don't know. I'd, I'd like a list of what you had in your bag so we can check to see what's missing. Well, I had the props for the banana nose bit, the pad of your own canoe, no touch of the balloons, eat a piece of pie, and saltwater taffy cut to fit the kisser. Can you describe those a little more fully? Well, in the banana nose bit, I come out and open with a slight laugh, you see. Well, Mr. Webster, I mean, can you describe the things you had in the bag a little more fully? Oh. Well, for the banana nose, I got a prop schnoz with a little electric light in it, a pair of baggy pants, a breakaway tuxedo and a pair of shoes about three feet long. Go on, please. In the paddle your own canoe bed, I use a hot water bottle, a derby with a hole in the brim. A pair of pants with patches on the knees. Right. And a hot water bottle. Yeah. Well, that's it. Then there's a sailor suit missing. Oh? Yeah, and Dudley's about the same size as Webster. And those clothes we found must be the ones he took from the guard on the train. Probably. Mm hmm But even a sailor's uniform wouldn't have done him any good at the airport. Nobody boarded the last flight at this stop. Yeah, well, he must have had a definite reason for taking it. Hey, maybe he decided to thumb his way, you know, figured the uniform would get him a quick lift. Oh, well, I thought of that, Sheriff, but I think he's too smart for it. After all, he's in a car now, and he knows we've got no description on the car or the driver. That's true. You know, he might fool a lot of people with that uniform. He was in the Navy during the war till he was dishonorably discharged. Mm hmm You ever wear a uniform during a job? No, no, that's not his pattern. My guess is he took this for transportation. Well, he won't get through the roadblocks this time because every car is being checked inside uh, and hold out. Hold on, Sheriff. I just remembered something on that map of yours. Let's take another look at it. Not on that plane. The girl at the counter told me she had a call asking when the next plane was taking off. If that was him calling, he may wait till the last minute and make a run for it. The man who called identify himself? No, but you... Wait a minute, Sheriff. Somebody just coming out from behind that building. Oh, a sailor. Yeah. Heading for this gate. Uh-huh. That looks like Dudley. He's big enough to be. It's him. Hold it, Dudley. Uh, Peter, look out. No, you don't. All right, Sheriff. Pick up his gun while I put the cuffs on him. Webster, you're on, Nick. Okay. Hey, girls. Yeah. Girls. How do we look? Oh, swell, okay. swell. Look, I wrote a new opening joke for the restaurant bit. Let's throw it in this show. How does it go? Well, after you two sit down at the table, I bring you each a menu, just like we do now. Then, Gloria, you say, this is printed in French. This is printed in French. 
No, no, no. Uh, this is printed in French. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh, this is printed in French. That's it. Then Ruth points to her menu and says, I'll have some of this. I do a double take and say, Madam, that happens to be what the orchestra is playing. <laughs> Pretty good, eh? If that gets a laugh, I'll carry you piggyback to the hotel. Look, the FBI man. Oh, hello, Mr. Taylor. Hello, Mr. Webster. I'm glad I found you. Here, your sailor uniform's in this bag. Well, thanks. Hey, that means you found the guy. That's right. We arrested him a little while ago. Isn't this exciting? How'd you come up with him? Well, the things you girls heard gave us the lead. Huh? You said you heard Dudley mention the airport and the fact that he was wearing an outfit of some kind. Oh, then you found out about the outfit being the sailor suit. We're half up to there. Well, the first time the sheriff showed me a map of this particular area, I noticed a naval air station close by. Dudley must have known about it, too. Oh, so that's why he glommed the uniform. That's it. He wanted to hitch a ride on a Navy plane. To where? Uh, any place, as long as it was far away. He did that during the war, but we arrested him when the plane landed. This time, he never got off the ground. Frank Dudley was returned to state authorities to serve the life sentence previously imposed upon him. After the capture of Frank Dudley at the Navy airport, a slip of paper was found in his pocket bearing the name of a man with whom he had once been arrested. That man was located, and when arrested, the FBI laboratory found that the tires on his car matched the tire tracks found in front of the cabin. After seeing the laboratory report, he confessed and received a prison sentence for conspiring to aid a federal fugitive. In tonight's case, you heard how a special agent of your FBI, in cooperation with a local law enforcement agency, was able to free a trio of innocent people taken hostage, and also to prevent a killer from making good his escape. Because he was armed, and because he was a known killer, there is a chance Frank Dudley would have added to his list of victims had he been successful in remaining free. Of course, no one will ever know who that potential victim would have been, or where he lived or when the killing would have taken place. One thing, however, is certain. Wherever you are, you're safer because this homicidal maniac is again behind prison bars. Safer because of the efforts of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Part of the American dream is owning your own home, giving your children a good education, retiring someday with enough money to enjoy life. If that's your dream, too, what are you doing about it? If nothing is your answer, why not consult a man whose business is making dreams come true? He's your neighbor, your local Equitable Society representative. He's helpful, he's honest, and he knows the answers. It will pay you to do business with him. Simply consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Armed Robbery. Its title, The Five Fathom Stick-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Sally Cassell, Walter Catlett, J.C. Flippin, Frank Gersel, Tony Hughes, Charles Maxwell, Victor Rodman, and Peg Lacentra. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation on This Is Your FBI. <laughs>